very good morning all it's my great privilege to welcome all of you for this uh, today session uh, i welcome first of all sandeep kothari for today's speaker sir uh, thank you very much we missed your uh, session last time but okay uh, anyhow we got it uh, apologies for that i had some personal emergency so session yes yeah uh, as you know that in today's scenarios as a valuer we need a lot of knowledge uh, in the other acts like company act income tax act in other especially like uh, esops and understanding the their capital structure the company's capital structure is very very important because the clients are looking a uh, lot of knowledge or a lot of information from the valuer before going to assignment and as uh, every bva member i request uh, uh, to get more knowledge in these uh, experts like uh, esops or other market uh, market approaches and again uh, valuations in different scenarios uh, and understanding their capital structure and we have to give more information to the uh, client it is not just to okay, they are asking valuation and we are taking their five years projections and uh, bringing some dc of value or what our complaints we are doing this is very very important to the scenario then only the client will get more uh, what to call uh, they they think that okay they, this this person is having knowledge and they can provide okay good information on us and when we talk to the client okay they, they are expecting more and with this now uh, i request uh, shilpa to introduce the today's speaker and start the session good morning everyone it gives me immense pleasure to introduce today's speaker mr sandeep kotari he is a chartered accountant company secretary he has done diploma in ifrs he is a chartered financial analyst a registered valuer and also an insolvency professional he is speaker on topics related to valuation at icai icsi rvo and other professional forums he is a guest faculty for registered valuer course at the top 3 registered valuer organizations icsi rvo icai cma rvo faculty for cfa and financial modeling with ims pro school since 2017 he is spreading financial literacy through articles on personal finance in linkedin yes mr sandeep now i am curious to follow you on uh, linkedin <laughs> and his areas of practice on valuation is uh, valuation of shares bonds other securities startups options under esop scheme sweat equity mergers and acquisition intangibles preferential issues takeover delisting and etc uh, mr sandeep actually maybe i should have focused more on your profile uh, you know sweat equity was one thing which was on our cards for a very long time yes we will get back to you on that separately sure. uh, yes over to you mr sandeep uh, thank you uh, sir venkat subrahu for uh, setting the context and uh, shilpa for that uh, very energetic introduction and uh, good morning and welcome all of you to today's session let me share my screen okay. so is this screen visible yes sir it is visible. yes yes sandeep okay so today's uh, discussion is going to be on uh, an introduction to the valuation of complex securities so let's look at the uh, agenda for today's uh, session okay. to start with understanding what was the need for a complex capital structure we can see that uh, most of the startups today they have a complex capital structure so we'll start with understanding what is the need for this complex capital structure and then we want to look at what are the various rights that are associated with these complex instruments so typically when uh, these securities other than equity or ccps in most of the cases are being issued they carry certain rights which are different from your traditional preference shares or the equity share so we'll try to understand what are those different uh, kind of rights that are typically attached to these preference shares and then we'll uh, look uh, go on and understand is it possible to incorporate all these rights that these instruments carry in the valuation methodologies that we have so which of these rights could be incorporated into the valuations and which of these rights could not be incorporated into the valuation that's what we'll try to understand there and then we'll look at uh, the enterprise value allocation methods where we'll try to see how uh, a value the overall value of the entity 
is allocated among different uh, series of securities and the equity shares case of complex capital structure. Uh, so there are three methods there. We'll look at it when we go to that slide, but we'll be focusing more on the option pricing method today because that is one of the most common method uh, which is used for enterprise value allocation. So we'll focus on option pricing method and then we'll also look at a few illustrations. Uh, we'll take up one very simple case in the beginning and we'll try to understand the mechanics of option pricing method uh, in the slides and then we go to the Excel file and I have a couple of more case studies depending on the uh, time that we are left with. We'll try to solve uh, uh, two or more case studies during the session. That is the agenda for today's uh, session. Uh, let's keep it interactive. So BBA is one platform where uh, I also use their library of YouTube videos and have learned a lot on the valuations. So I'm sure the uh, participants today would be definitely having a great amount of knowledge on the areas of valuation. So let's keep it interactive uh, and make the most out of the session. Let's understand why there was a need for a complex capital structure. Why is that uh, a pure equity or a plain equity share would not suffice or would not serve the purpose of the investors in case of startups? So as we all know, the VCs and other investors who get into these startups, they typically invest in unproven business model. Many a times in just pre-revenue or even in the ideation stage where it's just an idea without any uh, sort of uh, uh, proper business model. So because of this unproven business model, the high amount of risk that they are exposed to, the investors seek two uh, main things from the company. One is the higher returns and the other is the significant control or influence over the operations of the entity. So how are they going to get these higher returns and significant control, which put them a step above the equity shares? So that is typically achieved by issuing these CCPS, which are compulsory convertible uh, preference shares in most of the cases. Some entities also issue different sort of uh, uh, instruments like OCPS, etc. But CCPS is perhaps the most common instrument which is uh, used by these early stage investors, the VCs, etc., to uh, to achieve their objective of higher returns plus a significant control influence on the entity. And when these CCPS are being issued by the uh, investors, what also happens is we know that in case of startups, the investments happen over a series of rounds. So it's not that they raise the funds once and they stop there. They're going to raise this uh, funding continuously uh, after, a, uh, let's say, after a few months or after a few years, depending on the uh, funding requirements of the entity. So because of these multiple rounds of funding, the complexity of the capital structure keeps on increasing because with every successive rounds of funding, the new investor who comes in wants to stay above not only the equity shareholders, not only the existing equity shareholders, but also he wants to stay above the existing CCPS hold. So that's the reason each of the series of preference shares would CCPS would typically have rights that would differ from those of the other series. Uh, they would try to put themselves above the existing shareholders, both equity and preference. These rights in most of the cases, uh, the rights that are attached to the CCPS are substantive, which means they have a good amount of impact on the uh, value that these ones carry, are intensely negotiated between investors, uh, by the investors with the founders and other uh, existing uh, capital holders. So at the same time, when these rights have so much of uh, substantive impact on the entity's uh, uh, value, on the instrument's value, they decide the share in enterprise value of each class of security. So the overall uh, value that the entity has, that gets divided in different proportions among these holders of various series of instruments. Right? So the, the agenda today is going to be to understand how these uh, substantive rights could be incorporated in the uh, value allocations among these different different series of shares. So let us uh, look at the rights that are associated with preference shares. I would like to ask the audience what kind of rights you typically see are associated with the CCPS when uh, these new series of CCPS or existing series of CCPS that the startup has. What kind of rights do you generally find attached to these CCPS? If you can name a few rights. Either by way of chat preference. Or... Sorry? Liquidation yeah. preference. Okay, liquidation preference is one of them. Dividend. Dividend, okay, we'll come to that. Anti-dilution. Anti-dilution is one of the very powerful uh, rights that the CCPS carry. 
I can also see some answers in the chat participating. Tag along, right? Drag along, right? Yes, tag along, drag along. Affirmative votes on certain reserve matters. Okay, I can also see uh, one answer which says control and economic rights. So that's great. Control and economic rights are the two broad heads under which these rights could be classified. So you can see the uh, list of uh, rights that would be typically attached to a preference share, to a convertible preference share. If you want to classify all the rights that are attached with these securities under two broad headings, all of these rights which you see in the preference shares could be classified under two broad heads. The first one is the economic rights. The second is the control rights. So what is an economic right? What is a control right? Let us understand that first and then we'll go and see what are the various economic rights and what are the various control rights, right? So economic rights are typically designed to facilitate better economic results for preferred stockholders as compared with the common stockholders. So these economic rights give an advantage, uh, economic advantage to the preference shareholders or the later series of preference shareholders over the common stockholders. So these rights could relate to the time, basically the timing when the cash flows come to the uh, cash flows or returns come to the preference shareholders, or they could be in terms of preference given to these uh, instrument holders over the common stockholders, and also the amount of returns that the preferred stockholders would receive as compared with the holders of other classes of stock. So economic rights would give some sort of an economic benefit over and above what the common shareholders would be entitled to. So this differentiates the uh, CCPS holders in terms of the better economic results. Then there are certain other rights which are classified under control rights. So control rights are used by these uh, preference shareholders to influence or control the enterprise in a manner that is disproportionate to their ownership percentage. Now they might be having a, uh, in the overall uh, capital structure, they might be holding a uh, very a uh, small or let's say not so significant uh, percentage of the overall uh, capital. But because of these control rights, the CCPS holders would be able to influence or control the enterprise in a disproportionate manner. Disproportionate with reference to the ownership percentages, right? So these are the control rights. Let us uh, look at some of the economic rights and control rights. We'll spend some time to understand uh, each of these rights. And then we'll go on and see which of these rights could be incorporated in valuation, which aren't be incorporated in So some of the economic rights, uh, some of them have already been uh, named by the audience. So these are preferred uh, dividends, liquidation preference, conversion rights, mandatory redemption rights, anti-dilution rights, and registration rights. All of these fall under economic rights. Uh, if you look at the control rights, you have voting rights, protective provisions, and veto rights, board composition, drag along rights, participation rights, first refusal right, and OCL right, and management right, and information right. So these are the broad uh, set of rights that are attached with the preference charts. Now, it's not necessary that each of these rights would be attached with every security. That will depend on the negotiations and what the uh, investor intends to uh, have as part of his rights. So uh, I, I can see some questions on what uh, registration right is. So what we'll do is we'll spend some time, maybe uh, 10 minutes or so, and try to understand more of this economic rights and control rights. So we'll first go into the economic rights where we have the preferred dividends. Now, if you look at the uh, current uh, way, the, the way the CCPs are structured, the dividends really are immaterial in most of the instruments you'll see it is 0 0.001. So this was more uh, relevant with the traditional sort of preference shares. Dividends was one of the uh, key feature. But if you look at uh, the CCPs today, the uh, dividends are generally insignificant. The reason being, the objective is not to take out the money from the startup because the startups are already struggling with the uh, with the funding. So you don't want to burden them further by taking out dividends on a regular interval. Rather, you are interested more in the returns that you would make at a later point of time. So that's the reason most of the CCPs would come with a 0.001 or sort of a negligible uh, reference dividend attached to them. Right now, this uh, dividend could either be accumulative or non-cumulative. Uh, if it is uh, cumulative, then uh, if the dividend is not paid during a particular period, it keeps getting added. If it is uh, non-cumulative, then if the dividend is not declared in a particular year, it lapses. But as I said, this is not much relevant in this uh, context. And coming to the second right, which is liquidation preference, this is one of the key differentiating factor between the preference and common stock. So liquidation preference, uh, it gives first priority rights to preferred stockholders. 
whenever the entity goes into liquidation, funds that are available, the value that is available with the entity, preference shareholders will be entitled to take out some share out of the uh, available value before equity shareholders get any amount from the available value, right? So another important thing to understand at this point of time is when we say liquidation preference and liquidation event, it necessarily does not mean only dissolution of the entity. Typically, when we say liquidation, uh, we might uh, think that dissolution or when the entity goes uh, bankrupt or something of that sort, the liquidation will uh, come into picture. But liquidation event also includes merger, sale, change of control, or sale of substantially all assets of an enterprise. So apart from dissolution, which could be one of the liquidation events, the other sort of liquidation events include your know, mergers, sale, change of control, etc. Now, broadly, the liquidation preference could be divided into non-participating preferred and participating preferred. So in case of a non-participating preferred, you would have a liquidation preference. Beyond that liquidation preference, once you receive the liquidation preference that you are entitled to, anything that is left goes to equity shareholders. In case it is a participating preferred, then once uh, you get your uh, liquidation preference, after that, the excess value that the entity has, that will also be distributed among both equity and preference. So that's about liquidation preference. Uh, the other right is the... A point I had, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So when this liquidation preference, uh, already e preference is given, that whatever amount was invested is given back to them. So whatever is equity is kept separate and then the balance is given between preference and equity or just, in, just the thought? In, in case of a liquidation event, if the CCPS holders decide not to convert, they would have the option either to convert or to take out the liquidation preference. So if they decide not to convert, then typically uh, whatever is the liquidation preference they're entitled to, if that much amount is left with the entity, they would be paid that amount. Anything left after that will go to the equity shareholders. If we'll, we'll be seeing in the case studies later, there might be scenarios when they would want to convert. If they convert, then these values, whatever value the entity has to be divided among all the classes of shares, including the equity shares in the proportion of the number of shares. If they decide not to convert, that is when they'll get the liquidation preference. And beyond that, if it is a non-participating, they would not be entitled to any further amount. As a valuer, when are we expected to examine all these rights? Uh, can you tell us the scenarios? Like one, one could be in A's, one could be the transfer of preference shares as such. So any other scenarios when uh, this all this you know examining of rights have to be understood? Typically, uh, we do these value allocations, value allocation exercise at the time of uh, financial reporting, as you rightly pointed out in terms of India's where we want to compute the fair value of uh, either the CCPs or the equity shares. The other scenario could be in case of ESOP valuations, where you need the value of equity share as well. So when you're trying to value the ESOP, ESOPs, we take uh, the value of equity and then we try to value the uh, ESOPs or the options that the employees have. So there, again, you need equity as one of the inputs. So where we'll have to go and see the capital structure and uh, the uh, the value that the equity shareholders will be entitled. So that is the value which we should take when we do the ESOP value. Okay. So Please the next... You when to launch the poll. Uh, okay. Uh, it's see. okay. As and when you get that slide, just one... You can let me know when to launch. I think some of the poll questions uh, we will just miss to launch. So probably then we can take it somewhere in the middle of the presentation or towards the end of the session. Yes, yes. All right. So the uh, next fight that uh, the preference shares could carry is the mandatory redemption, right? It's a sort of put option where uh, the CCS holders may go and uh, redeem their, uh, their investments or their uh, instruments even before the occurrence of a liquidity event. So it is to provide a kind of a comfort to them that uh, they have this right, they can go and get their uh, preference shareholders redeemed and take the liquidation preference out. But typically the CCPL holders would not want to do this because in the early stages, if they try to excise this right, they might end up getting uh, nothing or at least they might not end up getting the entire amount that they've invested, right? But yeah, this is also right which can be attached to a CCPL. Conversion rights, uh, so we all know this is the main feature of uh, today's CCPS that we see. Uh, they could be converted into equity. Uh, and when this conversion rights come, they also uh, typically have the anti-dilution uh, attached to this. 
So where we'll see that in case of uh, subsequent funding round that happened, if there's a down round where the valuation is lower than the uh, previous round, then the conversion ratios can also be adjusted in case of the existing CCPS holders. So that's anti-dilution. We'll be discussing more on that. And uh, there could also be an adjustment to the conversion rate for the unpaid cumulative dividends, uh, if any. Typically, we saw that the dividends are negligible. So this right might not be that relevant. But yeah, if the CCPS holders want, we can also have this right. Yeah, this is an important right that many uh, reference shares would carry, which is anti-dilution right. So this is uh, this provides them a downside economic Excuse protection. Me, are not moving. It's still mandatory redemption right only. Are you not seeing anti-dilution yeah. rights? No, now it's come. Now it's come. Yeah. Anti-dilution. Thanks. So these anti-dilution rights will provide uh, downside economic protection to the preference stockholders, and particularly in case there is a subsequent down round of financing. So down round would mean that if I've done the uh, series A at let's say uh, 100 rupees, in the subsequent round we do when we do a series B that is below that uh, valuation that the earlier round was done at. So in that case, uh, the anti-dilution rights would help the CCPS to tweak the conversion ratio. That could be done in two manners. One is full ratio, the other is partial ratio. So in case of full ratio, the, uh, the dilution, anti-dilution right would give full benefit to the uh, preference shareholders where whatever down down does happen, based on that down down, entire conversion ratio would be changed so that they are placed at the same level with the current funding around CCPS holders. In case of partial ratio, the anti-dilution right would work, but it would not give them full 100% benefit. It would be in proportion of whatever investment is being made uh, in the current round versus what was the investment that was made by the existing CCPS holders in the earlier rounds. So it will give them an anti-dilution benefit, but that will be in some sort of a proportions. In case of full ratio, 100% anti-dilution right will be given to the CCPS holders, existing CCPS. Then there's another right, which is registration right. So this is uh, typically it will, uh, when the startup is not able to complete the IPO within a specified period, certain percentage of uh, preference shareholders can go and uh, pressurize the management, can go and force the management that you make your best efforts and try to bring about IPO and give us a liquidity or give us an exit. Let us discuss the control rights. So these rights that you have discussed are all economic rights. Let us discuss some control rights as well. Uh, Mr. Sandeep, again, your slides are not moving. Okay. Mr. Sandeep, I have a uh, doubt on this anti-dilution rights. Yeah. How would have, uh, exactly what is the anti-dilution, how would the, the CCPS before conversion, after conversion, and the way to, what the documentation uh, how we get uh, executed? Can I give one? Uh, see, all these, all these rights which we see here would typically be part of your uh, shareholder agreements and the term sheets. Okay. So most of the times, where if, uh, if you want to find out which of these rights are part of the CCPS or which of these rights are not then the CCPS, uh, you'll have to go and look at the uh, shareholders agreement where all these rights would be listed. So that's why you'll find whether the company or whether the shareholders have these anti dilution rights or not. So, so oh, my doubt is uh, first uh, round one is issued 100 rupees, subsequently it becomes 80 rupees. Whether the conversion ratio has to be increased, is it to the already CCPS allot allotted? Yes. If there's so, a down yes. round, if there's a down round. So typically this anti dilution would come into place when there's a down round, and that is where you'll have to give the benefit to the existing series of CCPS holders. So the conversion ratio, ratio, what is agreed at the time, 100 rupees will get increased now. Yes. By chance, if it is converted, it will not impact, no? Typically, you will not convert it unless the liquidation event happens, right? The CCPS would continue to uh, remain a CCPS unless the liquidation event happens. So, I will just give you one numerical example, very simple example to understand the anti dilution, right? So, if uh, let's take an example where 10,000 shares of preferred stock are outstanding with a $1.10 conversion. Uh, price and dollar ten original issuance price. So that means they would convert at one is to one, right? Yeah. Now, assuming the company has done a new round of funding, where uh, that new round has happened at a dollar five per share value. So the earlier round was at dollar ten. 
Now the subsequent round that has happened is at dollar five per share. So what will happen is the conversion ratio of existing shareholders, which was one is to one, in case it is a full ratio, it will get converted uh, into one is to two. So they'll get uh, two equity shares for every TCPS that they hold. That is how the full ratio anti dilution would work. If it is a partial ratio, then you would not only look at the uh, the down down values, but you'll also look at the proportion of funding that is received in the current round versus the proportion of funding that was received in the earlier round. It's, it will be in some sort of a weighted average. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Voting rights, uh, typically even uh, the preference shareholders would want to have voting rights uh, that would be that they would be entitled to they convert into equity shares. What would be the voting rights they would get? Generally, they would also have these sort of voting rights attached, apart from some veto rights, which we want to see in the next. Yeah, so there could be protective provisions and veto rights. There would be certain transactions where uh, the preference shareholders would have the ability to veto those actions. Typically, those actions could be change in the rights of preferred stockholders. So if the entity or the startup decides that they want to change the rights of the preferred stockholders, any of the series, they would have to get a major or at least a fixed percentage of the preferred stockholders approval prior to doing that. Such approvals could also be required in case of increase or decrease in the number of preferred stocks or creation of a new class or new series of preferred stock because they would impact the rights of the existing rights or uh, the benefits that the existing uh, stockholders are enjoying. In case of MNDA, corporate reorganization, yeah. change of control, etc., again, we require approval from at least a fixed percentage of preference shareholders. So these sort of uh, give them veto rights. They put them above the equity shareholders. So while typically we would uh, be in a, the equity shareholders would be in a position to make all the major decisions in an entity. But because of these veto rights, the preference shareholders uh, would also be required to be taken into, uh, uh, the consent would be required to be taken for these transactions could be done. The other important right which uh, CCPS holders would typically demand is the board composition right. Every series would want their representative, investor of every series would want to have their representative on the board. Uh, this is an indirect way of controlling the uh, company's operations or the major decisions that the entity makes. These board rights would provide the preferred stockholders the ability to control the board composition, again, in a manner that is disproportionate to their share ownership. In some cases, the latest series of preferred stocks will insist on the right to appoint a majority of the board. This is this could also be negotiated in some cases, where if the uh, latest series which is coming in, latest series of uh, that is being issued, the investors would demand that the majority of the board holders should be, or the majority of the board of directors should be appointed by this series of as well as. So this would result in more concentration of power in a single class of power. Uh, just to share my experience, these days, uh, some of them are insisting on the quorum also, like whoever is the board observer or the, you know, investor representative director, his presence is insisted as quorum. Shareholders meeting also, board meeting also. So that time, practically, it, it could be difficult. But then, yes, some investors are insisting. Yes. So many of these investors would uh, literally want to control the entity. Irrespective of their uh, proportion of investments that they've brought in, they would typically want to control the entity in some manner or the other. So that's the reason so many different different sort of rights we can see. And they are generally attached to these issues. Uh, so the other right is the drag along right, where uh, the, typically the drag along right would help the prospective buyers. Because when someone wants to come and acquire the entity, when there are so many series of instruments that are existing, if all the series of uh, instrument holders do not want to sell their stake and go out, what might happen is the acquirer might not get absolute control of the entity. If only certain, let's say out of the four or five series that the entity has, only two series are interested to uh, sell their stake and move out. The other series are not willing to sell their stake. And the incoming investor will not get this control over the entity and he might not be interested to work with this transaction. So that is where you, these diagonal rights would help, where one class of shareholder can compel the other class of shareholders to vote in the manner in which this particular class is uh, voting. So this will help in getting absolute control of the entity. 
the new acquirer of the entity in case there's a sort of a sale of the entity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so sort of background of uh, the members, uh, this rights can you can little bit make it faster and you know so that the focus okay. is more on the impact of the rights. Okay, good. So we'll just quickly uh, finish this off. I think there are actually more uh, rights that are left, and then we'll look at the advising uh, method. Okay, so the other right is the participation right. So essentially, here the preference shareholders. Uh, would be entitled to participate, the existing preference shareholders would be entitled to participate and purchase shares in every subsequent funding round. The idea is they are able to maintain their proportion in the overall capital structure. Uh, this is first refusal and co-sale right. Some of you said uh, tag along right. So this is the first refusal. The co-sale right is essentially the tag along right. In case of first refusal right, the CCPS order, the idea of both these rights is that they want to restrict the founders to exit the organization. They want to restrict the founders moving out of the uh, company or giving someone else the rights of uh, these founders. So in case of first refusal, the existing shareholders would be entitled to acquire these shares from the founders at the same price which the third party has given them. In case of a, a tag along or co sale right, the CCPS holders would also be entitled to offer their shares for sale whenever the founders are deciding to sell their stakes in the company. So, management right would uh, give the CCPS holder the inspection rights, the, basically to inspect the enterprise books of accounts in detail. There could also be information rights where uh, the CCPS holders would demand for. A uh, set of uh, fixed templates of MIS, monthly MIS, quarterly MIS, or some sort of financial data, uh, which the equity shareholders might not be entitled to. Apart from the annual reports, which the company publishes, the uh, CCBS holders might require some uh, monthly MIS or quarterly MIS from the company. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the uh, rights which the CCBS holders might have, the economic and control rights. The next question is, can I incorporate all these rights into the valuation? So what, what are your thoughts? Is it possible to incorporate all these rights that we have discussed, all the economic rights, all the control rights in the valuation? Is it possible to do that? What do you think? Or which of these you think could be incorporated? Which of these could not be incorporated? The economic rights can be incorporated, but not control rights. Okay. So that is right. Rights can be included is what I I think. Combination you can you can try to achieve control by incorporating some of these rights, but not all of the features that you have mentioned can be incorporated. So we are talking from the valuation perspective. Of course, in SHA, some or all of these rights would be there. But if you look at the in terms of the uh, value, the method that I want to discuss today, which of these rights could be incorporated? So as one of you rightly pointed out. Many of the economic rights, it is possible to incorporate them in the value allocation methods. Uh, so let us look at which of the rights could be incorporated and which can't be. Yeah, so we looked at these economic rights. So here we have the nature of right. Basically, these are the rights that we have discussed earlier. Uh, are they substantive? Some of them are substantive. Some of them like preferred dividends, non-cumulative are not substantive. But registration rights are also not substantive. Substantive meaning they, would they have a great bearing on the value of the uh, series of shares that we are trying to value. Now, the important question to answer is, can the value allocation methods that we are going to discuss incorporate all these rights? The answer to that is in the last column on this slide. So if you see, most of the economic rights could be incorporated. Some, like the mandatory redemption, the anti-dilution, the registration rights cannot be incorporated into the uh, valuation uh, methodology that we are going to discuss today. So we do have limitations even here. Some of the rights could be incorporated, some could not be. But we can see many of the rights which are substantive in nature, many of the economic rights which are substantive in nature, can be incorporated in the value allocation. What about the control rights? Can the control rights be incorporated in the valuation? Are they substantive? So these are the uh, rights that we have discussed in these slides earlier. And if you look at uh, whether these rights are substantive, we can see that all the Control rights are substantive. They have a good impact of bearing on the uh, valuations. But unfortunately, the value allocation methods cannot incorporate these control rights when they try to allocate the value among. Right? So 
uh, economic rights, most of them could be incorporated. Control rights, the allocation methods are not in a position to incorporate these control rights when they try to allocate the value. Okay. So then with these substantive rights, we have discussed uh, so many different uh, rights that the preference shareholders could have as part of their SHAs. So once these rights are brought into the SHA, they definitely give an edge to the CCPS holders over and above the equity shareholders. So it might not be appropriate in many cases to divide the value of the enterprise equally, equally among the uh, various instruments, including the equity shareholders. Sometimes you also use these rules of thumb that whatever was the uh, latest funding round, uh, the value at which the CCPS was issued, we apply a 25% discount or some 30% discount on these uh, valuations to see what could be the value of the equity. But again, those numbers which we the discounts that we use, the rule of thumb discounts that we use, uh, might not be uh, might be difficult to justify uh, with a reasonable uh, support. So that's the reason it's better to go for a proper value allocation method where uh, the rights are incorporated and we can see that there's a difference in the value of different fees of institutional So how do we then go about allocating the value among the different series of uh, uh, instruments that the entity has? So what do we mean by value allocation? First, let's make that clear. So when we are talking about the enterprise value allocation methods here, we are not talking about the valuation of the entity itself. The valuation of the entity would be done in your usual uh, uh, methods like the market income or cost approach, whichever method you choose to apply, you may apply the DCF or the market approach uh, and figure out the value of the entity. Once the equity value is derived, that is where these enterprise value allocation methods come into picture. So we try to figure out how that overall value of the entity has to be distributed among these different series of uh, instruments which the entity has issued. So that could be achieved by way of three methods. One is the probability weighted expected return method. We also call it PWERM. The other is the option pricing method and then this current value method. There are different uh, scenarios when typically these one of these methods would be applied to uh, figure out what would be the, uh, how, how should the allocation of the overall value be done over the various instruments that the entity has. And now, one of the key uh, characteristics, one of the key uh, points that would help you to decide which method could be appropriate is the timing left or the timing that you feel is left for the liquidity event. If you feel the liquidity event is imminent, it's going to happen uh, uh, immediately now or within a very short time, then a current value method is typically preferred where you go and see what could be the value of each instrument if the entity goes and it's a liquidity event or liquidity event today. But most of the cases, we might not be at that level where we are about to go for a liquidity event. That's the reason typically we don't apply a current value method. And the other method that could be used is the probably weighted expected return method. This would typically be applied when we feel that uh, there are few years or very, uh, the liquidity event is not going to happen immediately, but there's only a short time left for the liquidation event to occur. In that case, we might again use the PWERM method. In most of the cases that we encounter today, uh, we see that there's still a long time left for the entity to, entity to go for a liquidity event. Uh, and that's the reason we go for option pricing method. So in option pricing method, the various series of instruments that the entity has are treated as call options. And based on the BSM, the Black Scholes model, we try to understand what could be the value of each of those series of instruments. So as you can see, well, let me just quickly run through this slide as well. In, in a probability weighted expected return method, the value is based upon the probability weighted present values of each class of shares. So we try to find out under different different liquidity scenarios, what if it's an IPO, what if it is a uh, sale of the entity, what if it is dissolution of entity, what would be the value of each instrument and then we assign probabilities and try to get a probability weighted uh, value of the each series of instruments. In case of option pricing method, as I told you, we treat each series as a call option on the enterprise value or the equity value that we've already derived. And then we try to find out what could be the value of each of the series of instruments. In the current value method, allocation of value to various series of preferred stock based on the liquidation preference or conversion value, whichever is greater, assuming the liquidation event is happening on the valuation date. If today the liquidation event happens, what would be the value of these different, different series of instruments from the current value method? Our focus today is going to be on the option pricing method. 
so as mentioned in this slide, no single method appears to be superior in all respects. So depending on the circumstances in which the uh, entity is, you would have to uh, probably choose which, which method would be appropriate to use. But most of the times, option pricing method is chosen for value allocation. So, uh, as I told you, option pricing method is not a method for determining the value of the business enterprise. It is rather a tool for allocating the total equity value to individual series of instruments that the company has. It considers the preferred and common shares as call option on total shareholder equity value. And uh, it, while doing that, it considers the rights and preferences of each class of shares. We saw some of the rights that could be incorporated. This method would incorporate. Uh, some of the rights that could not be incorporated, for example, the control rights, uh, even the OPM method would not be in a position to incorporate those control rights in the valuation. Okay, so we'll take up uh, one very simple illustration to start with and try to understand how the OPM works. I would request all of you to read through this uh, illustration. So this company started with uh, equity funding, which was uh, done by the founders, as we usually see. And then after a point of time, they went in for another uh, series, a convertible preferred stock, which was issued to venture capital. And it has a conversion ratio of one is to one, two comprised of one million shares convertible into equity in the ratio of one is to one. The preferred shares were issued for 35 per share. With total proceeds to the company of 35 million. So in normal 22, the company retains service of valuation firm to determine the fair market value of its common stock. The company has decided an enterprise value of 50 million. So this 50 million is the value of the company. So I'm writing enterprise value here, but effectively it means the equity value. Uh, they want us to value the equity share. So these are the other uh, rights that are attached the preference shares, the series A preference shares, in addition to the conversion that we've already seen in the previous slide. Maybe you can go through this as well quickly. So they have a liquidation preference. The series A preferred stock has a liquidation preference. Uh, which would be to the extent of 35 rupees per share, which is the amount that they've invested. And any amount remaining in remaining is paid to the common shareholders. This is basically a non-participating preference share. Protective provisions are also there where they need uh, to approve all these major decisions. They have a control over board of directors, drag along rights and anti-dilution rights. So these are all the rights that are attached to these preference shares. So I've summarized the capital structure here before we try to understand the uh, how the opium works. So let us first be clear about the capital structure. This entity has equity shares, which is 4 million equity shares, and the amount is 4 million again. It also has series A CCPS. 1 million shares have been issued at 35 rupees each. So that gives us 35 million. The current enterprise value, which has already been computed based on your uh, income approach, market approach, cost approach, and all the methods that could be used under there. Current value of the enterprise has been derived at 50 million. Liquidation preference for Series A preferred stock is 35 million, which is nothing but the amount that they've invested. So we already saw they have a liquidation preference of 35 rupees per share. Okay. So now let us understand the payoffs. What we need to do is we need to allocate this 50 million, which is the total equity value of the company, over these number of shares. I have 4 million equity shares and series A CCPS 1 million shares. How am I going to allocate this 50 million over these 4 million shares and 1 million shares? So tell me one thing, at the current value which the enterprise has, 50 million, would the series A CCPS want to convert to equity if there's a liquidation event? Would they want to convert to equity? 
Oh. What do you think? Oh. Oh. The current value of 50 million, would they like to convert into equity shares? No, sir. They will get less if they convert. So if they convert, how much are they going to get? Only 10 as against 35. Yes, so if they convert, this entire 50 million would be equally divided on these 5 million shares because once they convert, they become equity shares. Mm -hmm. So you'll have 5 million equity shares, 50 million we get divided over these 5 million shares, everyone would get 10 rupees. If they do not convert, then what happens? They, they get, get the 35 five. million in the first place. And then what yes. are the remaining 15 million? They would also have some share of that 15 million as well. Oh, no, no, nothing out of 15, sir. Nothing yeah, so if, if they do not convert, if they decide to uh, take the liquidation preference out, then they would, out of this 50, they would be entitled to get their 35 million out first. Whatever is left would be distributed among equity shares. Beyond that, they will not participate because we already saw it's a non-participating preference share. Okay, non-participating. So if the value is 50 million, it is beneficial for them to not convert. So let us understand the payoffs. The important activity that we need to do in case of option pricing method is to figure out the breakpoints. So I'll tell you in some time what are these breakpoints and how do we decide these breakpoints. Okay, so this is just to summarize in case you are still not clear uh, when they would convert and when they would not convert. So if it is the current value, the preference holders will decide not to convert. Then the important question is, at what point will the preference shareholders decide to convert? We just go back to this slide. At what point, at what value, at what equity value will the preference shares decide to convert? Beyond what value will the preference shareholders decide to convert? Beyond 1, one as to 35. Beyond? 1 as to 35, sir. That is 35 multiplied by 5. Uh, beyond that, only they will uh, be interested in converting. Yes. So they would be interested to convert into equity shares once all your equity shares also get 35 rupees. Beyond that, only they would be interested to convert. Right? So for them, it is beneficial to convert only when the enterprise value crosses 175. So until the enterprise value is 175 million, preference shareholders would prefer to take out the liquidation preference and not convert into equity. Once the enterprise value exceeds, enterprise value equity value exceeds 175 million, that is when they would want to convert into equity share. Is this point clear? This is a very important point that you should be clear with. If this is not clear, let me know. Here, in case if they would, don't want to convert, if they want to opt, liquidation preference means the promoters has to buy out, is it? With the 35 million? See, 35, 50 million is the value of the entity, which means right. if they sell this entity or whatever dissolution has been decided, 50 million is what you would recover. Okay. Now, this 50 million has to be divided among these uh, capital uh, these capital instruments, the equity and the series A. One is right? to one. So, one is to one will come if they decide to convert. Yeah. If they decide not to convert, then out of the 50 million, reference shareholders will take out that 35 million okay. and remaining will be divided over the equity shares. Okay. Got it. So Thank our question here is, at what point would the CCPS holders be interested to convert? We said that at 50 million, they will not be interested to convert because they are at a disadvantage. So at what point will they be willing to convert or beyond what point will they be willing to convert? The answer is 175 million because until I am getting 35 without converting. So until I get more than 35, I would not be interested to convert. So when would I get more than 35? When first? All the shareholders, all the common shareholders also get 35. And after that, if there's some more value, that is when I would be getting 35 per share. Right? So we are saying that the preference shareholders would be interested to convert or it will be beneficial for them to convert only when the equity value or the enterprise value exceeds 175 million. So now let us understand how the value of the entity will be distributed at different points among the series of uh, shareholders. So up to 35 million of value. To 35 million of value, the entire value will go to which class, equity or preference? Up to 35 million of the ent entity value. Let's say, 
yeah if the value of the entity is 35 million it will go 100% to efforts channel right so we have particulars value and distribution here so first payoff would be up to 35 million the entire value will go to the preference shareholders so 100% is goes to preference shareholders so we are trying to create the breakpoints this is the slide which will help you to create the breakpoints which are essential in the opm exercise so i have taken this uh, example here with only one series we'll uh, in the ppt we'll do this and then when we go to the excel exercise i have taken uh, an example with multiple series of right so we are just starting with a simple third one. payoff also can you little bit explain third payoff yeah yeah i am explaining all of this i'll be explaining all of this so second payoff is from 35 million to 175 million to 175 million we are saying the preference shareholders will not convert so from 35 million of value to 175 million the entire proceeds will go to the equity shareholders 100% to the common shareholder is this fine pay off one pay off yes, two yes. any doubts yes clear okay now after 175 million so we are saying that once the entity's value crosses 175 million that is the point when the ccps holders would like to convert into equity and once they convert into equity when the liquidation preference goes off what will happen whatever is the value that entity has will be divided among the preference and equity shareholders because they have also converted into equity they have now become equity shareholders so they will be at par with the equity shareholders in that case in our example let me just go back a few slides yeah in this example if the ccps holders decide to convert into equity we have the number of shares here so all these 1 million will convert into 1 million equity shares then in what proportion will the value be divided between equity and ccps what would be the proportion in which the value will be divided between these two 80 and 20 percent yeah how do we get that 80 and 20 40 and 4 is to 1 yeah so 4 is to 1 because now the value once they convert the value will be equally distributed among both of them so you can take the ratio on the basis of number of shares typically it is on the basis of number of shares so these are going to convert 1 is to 1 so we can straight away take a ratio of 4 is to 1 so we need to bring in the conversion ratio here and based on the conversion ratio you decide what proportion will go to which moment so here it is 4 is to 1 and that is how we got this 80 20. yes so any uh, when the enterprise value goes beyond 175 million the distributions will be 80 percent to common shareholders and 20 percent to preferred shareholders these payoffs are clear this is the most crucial uh, step in the entire opm model uh, this, this is why you need to be very cautious. If these payoffs are set right, then your other steps will be very easy to follow. So anyone who has a doubt in this, let me know. So this uh, second payoff, 30, like uh, first 35 will be paid to the uh, preference shareholders. Whatever remains will be distributed 100% to the equity shareholders. Is my yes, understanding because right? Because up to 175 million of value, the CPS holders will not convert to equity. And this is a non participating preference share. So once they have taken out their 35 million, okay. and they decide not to convert up to 175 million, whatever is the differential will go only to the equity share. Yeah, thank you. The second one. Yes. Second payoff, not kidding. I get a confused. Second payoff. Entrepreneur to commerce, how it will. Okay, so if the company's value is crossing 35 million, but it does not cross 175 million, okay. in that in that zone, will the preference shareholders convert into equity? Will it be beneficial okay. for them to convert? Because in the earlier slide we saw they will oh, convert only. Yeah, yeah, yeah got it. Thank you. Thank you. Is achieved. Yeah, okay, got it, got it. Okay. So once you are fine with the payoffs, okay, I've also got this chart here. So some of you might be comfortable with these charts. You can have a look at it. It's again the same distribution of value among the different series. So you can see that up to 35 million, the amount goes entirely to preferred stock. These gray are preferred and blue, uh, sort of blue color shade, common shares. So up to 35, entirely it goes to the preference shares. From 35 to 175, whatever value is uh, there with the entity, that will be distributed 100% common. And anything beyond that, beyond 175, would Go to 80% common and preference shares. Right? 
the table was not clear. Maybe this will help you do clarity on it. Okay. All these, uh, all these, uh, yeah. all these uh, points will be mentioned in uh, SHA. Would it be oh, in SHA? These these points will not be mentioned in SHA. These points has to be done. I mean, we as valuers have to uh, bring all these things in Excel. So the liquidation preferences would be known that we can find out from the company because we we'll know what amount they've invested. Typically, whatever is the amount that the investor has invested. That is the liquidation preference they would have. So we, we can find out easily what is the first share liquidation preference. And once you get that, then you can compute these breakpoints. We'll be doing that with uh, one example, which we'll do in the Excel. So I think okay. it will be clear at that point of time. Okay, but but while issuing the preference shares, the, these are not required. While issuing the while this, issuing the preference shares, only enterprise value computation is required. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah, so see, you can still use OPM if you want. You can try to do a max solve uh, and get the OPM. When we go to the Excel, we'll do these calculations. I think many okay. questions will get answered there. And okay. uh, then if something is still unanswered, we can take it up. Again. Okay, then the next step is to set the assumptions. So as I told you, once you get your uh, breakpoints, you're going to treat each of these securities, each of these uh, series of security, all options. So we need to go and find out the value of these call options. So how is the option value determined? I'm just trying to set the context context of how option value is determined and what inputs we need to derive the value of these call options. Right? Options value could be determined on the basis of intrinsic value and time value. Typically, an options value is comprised of two components, the intrinsic value and time value. Intrinsic value is your difference between spot price and strike price. That is what will give you what is the intrinsic value. Time value of an option is derived with these three inputs or these three assumptions, the time to maturity, volatility, and risk. So when we are trying to use Black-Scholes model to find out the value of option, we need to fix these five assumptions for our entity. Because only if you fix these five assumptions, you can solve the BSM and get what is the value of each call option that you have determined, right? So option value is a function of intrinsic value and time value. Intrinsic value in turn is a function of spot price and strike price. Difference between spot price and strike price will give you the intrinsic value. And time value is driven by three factors the time to maturity, volatility, and just to quickly understand that, make it more clear for those who are not very uh, comfortable with the option valuation. I put this a simple example here. Let's just quickly understand this. Let's consider a six month call option with the strike price of 90. Return on a share with a current stock price of 100. So the strike price or excise price is 90. The price of the stock today is 100. Assuming the uh, option is expiring today, what would be the value of this call option according to you? If this option is expiring today, what would be the value of this call option? 10 rupees. It will be 10 rupees because something that is worth 100 in the market, I can buy it for 90 rupees. So this option has a worth of 10 rupees, the fair value of the option. So at expiration, the value of the option would typically be only the intrinsic value, which is spot versus strike price. You compare them, get the value of option. And any time before the expiration, the time value factor also comes into picture, right? So let us understand that as well. So before expiration, the same scenario, the stock price is 100 and the option is in the money. It will be excise. The value of the option will exceed 10 because there will be some time value component that will also get added. So how do we incorporate the time value of money? The share price is remaining the same. This strike price, which would be paid at expiry, I need to convert that to present value. Right? So if I want to convert the value, if I want to compute the value of this call option at inception, let us say at inception, not at expiry, and we say the share price is going to remain constant, just a theoretical assumption I'm making here. The stock price is going to remain constant over the tenure of this option contract. The only thing that will change in this formula is the strike price because I'm going to pay the strike price six months later. If I'm computing the value of the option today, I need to convert that strike price into present value. Right? So that can be done by using your uh, six months is the tenure of this option and 10% is the discount rate. So you will discount this 90 rupees for six months with a 10% discount rate. 
have done a continuous discounting here. You can take this formula and you'll get a value of 14.39. 10 rupees one on question, basic value. Sir. One question. Yeah. In the before expiration valuation, the T is equal to 0.5. How did you get that? R I understand is 10% per annum. T is equal to no. 0.5 that 90 E raised to 0.5 is, is six months. Six months. So that is your six by 12. Okay, this, this, is a, this is a per is annum. Yeah, six this is a per is annum discount rate. Yeah, okay. this is a per annum discount rate. Okay. Uh, but this contract is for six months. So we've just taken six months. Okay. Uh, and one small uh, point here, uh, R is risk-free rate in this particular thing, right? Yeah. So options, we typically use risk-free rate uh, to find out the present value. And also we use continuous discounting and continuous compounding in case of it's not your simple discounting and simple compounding. That's the reason you see E to the power here. Okay. So in this example, now the second component which we have is, uh, so in the second, before expiration, we've got a value of 14.39. So essentially what this means is 10 rupees is the intrinsic value and 4.39 is the time value uh, in this example. But what we have not considered is the volatility. Our assumption was that the share price remains 100 throughout the life of this option contract to the expiry of this option contract, which would not be true in case of in a practical scenario. And that change in the value of the share price is incorporated by way of volatility. When you bring in the volatility into this uh, entire uh, theme, you get uh, you you get to adjust for the changes in the share price, changes in the spot price, right? So if that is incorporated, this is how your uh, formula would become. This is your uh, Black Scholes model. This is the formula of Black Scholes Martin model. You have S zero. If you just look at the uh, the words which are in blue, uh, this particular formula, just first read whatever is in blue font color font in this. So you would realize that this whatever is in blue font is nothing but what we saw in the previous slide. I read my spot price minus present value of excise price. That is what we did in the previous simple option pricing example. To just accommodate the volatility, I bring in these two factors, ND1 and ND2. Now we will not go into detail of ND1 and ND2 today because that's not uh, uh, our agenda. But I just thought that uh, let us understand the BSM first and then we go to the OPA. Because BSM is going to be used to solve all those call options or those breakpoints that we have discussed earlier. So this BSM is clear. We bring in this ND1 and ND2 here in the earlier formula. This ND1 and ND2 would incorporate the volatility as well into the BSM. Okay. So we need to fix those five assumptions that we saw earlier. So option value is derived from five assumptions. So we need to fix those five assumptions and only then we can start solving for the call options. So the first assumption is the underlying security price. Now, in case of an option pricing model, the underlying security price is nothing but the equity value of the enterprise, the equity value of the company, which was 50 million in our example. Right? Is this clear? First assumption, the underlying security price or spot price that we are talking about, that is nothing but the total value of the entity, which is 50 million in our example. The other assumption that Just we need is... one small uh, clarification. This is the enterprise value, cash debt adjustment, equity value, right? Yeah. So in this discussion today, wherever I say enterprise value, that also means equity value. So we alternatively at some places, I might have mentioned enterprise value, but what we mean is equity value, the value that is available to these security holders, TCPS and uh, the equity holders. That will be after adjusting your debt and cash balances. So that is our first assumption. The second assumption that we need to fix is the exercise price. Now, these excise price is what we get based on the allocation of value that we did. So, in the next slide, where you see when we solve the BSM, these excise prices would be nothing but those breakpoints that we decided in the earlier slide. The allocations that we did in the earlier slide, where we said from 0 to 35, it will go to the preference, 35 to 175, it will go to equity, and anything beyond 175 will go in 80 20 ratio. So, those 0, 35, and 175 would become our excise price in this example. These are the liquidation preferences and conversion values. Is the second assumption clear? How we fix this assumption? If there's any doubt anywhere? Time to expiry and volatility, I would say these are the two very uh, complex assumptions. In fact, very subjective assumptions that we need to make when we use the OPM or even when we use the BSM for ESOP's valuation for that matter. 
So in case of OPM, this time to expiration is typically the, uh, the assessment of the value of when the entity will reach the liquidation event. So uh, from today, how long will it take for the entity to achieve the liquidation event, which would be a sale or an IPO or a distribution or whatever it is, right? So this assumption is, this is a subjective assumption as I told you, it's based on the uh, various factors. Typically what factors you should look at if you're trying to estimate this, you should look at the company's life cycle stage, the funding needs and strategic outlook. It stays the companies, if it is in just the ideation stage, then probably the time to expiration would be pretty long. It could be even 10 years or 20 years, it will be pretty long. If the company has already reached a sort of a matured stage, it has break even, it has got a good amount of scale, then the liquidation event might, uh, in a very shorter time, could be four or five years also. And also on the funding needs, the strategy me, If you could uh, repeat excise price. Okay, I'll I just finish this and then I'll repeat. Thank you. So, depending on the assessment of the life cycle of the company, in the life cycle, where is the company today? The, what are the funding needs? Does it need small, small funding or will it have to go for IPO and take a big funding? And the strategic outlook, how the management looks at the uh, providing the exit to the existing investors. Are they uh, having plans to do it in a, uh, in a near term or it's going to be a long time if they go for it? So based on those factors, you can determine what could be the liquidity uh, time to liquidity event. In this case, I've taken it at five years. So we've seen that uh, we have some examples now, for example, companies like Zomato. Uh, point up, point out. Yeah. In, this, in case of ESOP, this is in uh, vesting period, no? These are valuations, time to expiration. In case of ESOPs, yeah, it that, will typically be. Yeah, when, when this, this could be excised. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, so in this case, I've taken it five years, but if you see today, we have at least some examples uh, in, in India also. We have companies like Zomato, Paytm, PB Fintech, etc., which, which were startups and which have got listed. So, we might use them as a sort of example to substantiate our assumption here. So this could be anywhere in the range of 5 to 20 years or even beyond that. Beyond 20 might not seem reasonable, but I think 5 to 20 years could be uh, justified looking at the startups that have listed uh, on our exchanges. The other assumption which we need to make is volatility. Again, just like the ESOP uh, valuations, we need to figure out what the appropriate volatility. For listed stocks, it is easy to get volatility. The private companies, it is difficult to get volatility. So we look at, it's impossible to get volatility because the shares are not listed. So we try to look at uh, either peer companies or we look at some index. Or at times you can take index or some comparable company and add additional percentage to it. Get what would be the appropriate volatility assumption for this company. For valuing. This is again a subjective call. Uh, so in this case, I've assumed 30% as volatility. The last assumption, I think this is the... Uh, very simple assumption that the value makes it's the risk free rate. So you need to look at, uh, depending on the time to expire that you assume, what would be the uh, bond yield, the government bond yield or the risk free rate for that tenure. If you assume the time to expire of five years, then you go and refer a five year bonds yield. If you assume time to expire of 10 years, then you go and look at the 10 year bonds risk free rate. So based on that, you decide uh, what would be the risk free rate. It is nothing but yield on those government bonds closer to the tenure which you have taken here in the time to expire it. The excise price? Right. Yeah, yeah. In practically what happens is uh, uh, the difference between the options being exercisable at a given point in time or over a period of time uh, and the impact of that on the applicability of the Black and Scholes model. Uh, uh, do you, does it need any adjustment if let us say the options are excess, exercisable any time within a period of five years after the date? Typically, the options uh, would be excisable after the vesting. There would not be any, in most of the cases, what I've seen is there would not be any time that would be decided. You have to excise within this. When would someone yeah. want to excise the option? When they are able to get a liquidity event, right? So that is something that the company has to give them. Again, the excise of option would make sense only when... Uh, you're closer to liquidity. If you excise before that, you'll only end up paying taxes. You'll only end up paying uh, your no, but, taxes but on those options. After, once a certain period is reached, thereafter, if there is a lot of time given for the option holders to exercise, 
Okay, does that impact the applicability of the black controls model? Do we need to look at? Yeah, so so you will have to uh, yeah. see most of the cases. What you will see is the options. Even if after the rest, the employees don't prefer to excise them unless they see a liquidity event happening uh, sooner than later, right? Because if you excise it uh, before you feel the uh, the liquidity event is going to happen, what will happen is you will pay the taxes on that uh, income taxes on that option. And then you'll have to still wait to encash those options. So you would want to excise them when there's a possibility of encashing those options, right? Yeah, but I, I read somewhere that you know, the for the black and tools model to be applicable, the uh, options must be excess exercisable at a given point in time. And the moment that exercise period elongates beyond a certain period, uh, can it be disputed that you know uh, this method? Uh, so whatever whatever is the time you feel is left for excise, that is what you can assume here. So if you feel that it will be excised on a particular date because the terms are set in such a way, then that that would be your time to expiry. If there is no such set time, then typically we align this with the liquidity event or when the enterprise uh, plans to provide exit to these employees in case of ESOPs. But here in case of OPM, you look at the liquidity event. When is that uh, liquidity event is expected? That is when you go and do the uh, time to expiry is aligned to that event. Yeah, I think there's a poll question which has been put. Yeah, basically since I thought, you know, now we'll be going for uh, Excel maybe. So I thought if we could take time and, uh, you know, I request everyone to answer the poll question because the poll report will be submitted to IBBI as per CEP guidelines. Not many people have answered the poll. So I request you, everyone to... So this is a wake-up call for all of them who have not had their tea yet. <laughs> uh, actually thanks mr sandeep you know uh, even though these are fundamentals i was not actually very clear as to how i could go about and i got a better clarity now yeah so but that's the reason i chose a easier example in this slide and then we go to the excel we'll take up one complex scenario of course as i mentioned the reason i put introduction in the topic is because this is a very very vast topic i myself i'm still learning on this still experimenting on this so, but yeah, whatever little I know, I thought I can share. Uh, can you please uh, share the with the audience the right answer? There is no right answer to this. This poll was essentially for me to understand uh, what is that the values are doing currently. Most of the cases we see that uh, is they are valued at par with equity. Yeah, I mean some of them I've also answered. They use the enterprise value allocation methods, forty percent. They use the enterprise value allocation methods, it seems, and uh, 50% they value CCP at par with it. Yeah. Okay. So if you all of you are fine with these assumptions, then uh, if you freeze your breakpoints, if you freeze the assumptions, then rest is just math. You need to put these values in the formula that we saw in the previous slide and do the calculation of option values. Yeah, so the next step is deriving the branch values. Before that, another wake-up call for you. Please answer the poll question. The, with this, uh, shall I continue all the other poll questions or is it related to the case study? I, I think we can take the poll questions. Yeah, because once the Excel starts, I don't want any, any of okay. these polls to be disturbing us. Okay, so we can take the uh, poll question. Yeah. And uh, meanwhile, uh, till now, whatever the speaker has covered, I request all the participants to raise the queries while the poll is on. Mr. Sandeep, uh, I have one uh, query. Yeah. Can CCPS be redeemed before uh, that conversion? Yes, yeah, so we, we saw there are there are certain rights which are there, right, which allow them to demand redemption if the company is not able to uh, go for a liquidation event. It can be there, but the question is, would the CCPS holders want to do that? Because if they decide to redeem, the company itself might go into trouble, right? And typically, we see that the startups are struggling with uh, uh, funding. They need more and more of funding. So if at that point, even before the startup has reached a considerable scale, if the CCPS holders are in an urgency to redeem their money, to get back their money, their target or their goal of uh, getting significant returns which was the initial goal when they got it, would not be achieved and the startup might go into the trouble itself. It might go into dissolution. 
that is why many a times it will not be excites but those rights could be incorporated where you can demand a redemption of your uh, to the extent of your investment but will it not amount to like uh, to further uh, continue the discussion it, will it not amount to buy back or capital reduction if ccps is redeem redeem midway okay. so will it not amount to buy back or capital reduction if ccps is redeemed in midway if it is redeemable for preferences acceptable or optionally convertible preference shares if it is compulsorily convertible preference shares if you are redeeming like uh, uh, ccps holders are uh, demanding redemption in midway will it not amount, it to, not buy amount back, to buy back buy back or capital reduction i think that is a question that uh, probably some cs in our group here could answer so will it amount to buy back or what would you take it as uh, for a compliance purposes but you have to answer that can it be done yes if your shared agreements have these rights they can be done you can negotiate such rights as well okay. that is within within such period you don't give us a exit you don't give us a liquidation uh, event or you don't give us a exit then we would be in a position to come and demand the redemption of our investment such rights could be incorporated so call question two is which of the following rights could be associated with the ccps we had liquidation preference registration rights and information rights i think uh, most of you have answered right the correct answer is all of the above some of you have also selected only liquidation preference the right answer is all of the above because even registration rights and information rights we saw earlier could be part of the ccps so can we also take the next question yeah can you answer the third poll question please sandeep ji i have a question yeah so sandeep ji whatever uh, right now what we are discussing the option pricing model or uh, for uh, for example the companies issuing the ocd or the ocrps then when the company is issuing the shares of the ccd or oh, ocd <clears throat> then at that point of time we have to value only the equity and the investor in their financial statement as per the indias they have to value using this method is that the understanding correct no see indias valuation would come when you have invested in other entity or uh, in in terms of the securities that's when you need to find out the fair value for reporting purposes at the time of issuance what as per my experience what i have seen is most of the valuers uh, they decide to equally divide the value among all classes of shares and when we go to the excel i'll also tell you that in many cases that might also be appropriate but you can still use a back solve method and try to figure out what could be the value of the equity or what could be the value of a particular series of ccps at the time of issuance we'll discuss that when we go to the excel okay sure numbers. okay so this poll i am ending the poll now yeah so which of the following rights allow the preferred stockholders to purchase shares from founders uh, i'm not seeing the answers given by the participants Okay. <laughs> Participants got confused. <laughs> okay. Well, we already discussed this in one of the slides. That's the reason I had wanted to put the rights on slide and discuss because many a times these rights are also confusing. So this, in this case, we are discussing the right which allows the preference to holders to purchase shares from the founders at the price offered by a third party. So that right is the first refusal right. So, if the founders want to sell the shares to third party, they get some x uh, x rupees per share of offer. The preference shareholders will have an option to buy those shares at the same price. If they don't want to, then the founders are free to sell to any third. Party. First refusal right. I think there are two more questions. You want to take them now or towards the end? No. The next question is very straightforward. Can you all answer this? Mr. Sandeep, I have a question. Yes. Uh, while we are trying to derive the uh, value of each security by way of uh, you know uh, component wise, first we need to determine the the value of the entity at the point of liquidation, like uh, at the at the event of liquidation, right? Then only we are going to, you know, enter no. those values. Okay. 
so you don't have to uh, find out the value at the point of liquidation you have to find out the value of the entity today so just like when you are valuing the uh, entity using your dcf or comparable company method or a comparable transaction method it's the same exercise you don't have to do any different exercise here you first derive the value of the entire entity the exercise will help us to allocate that total value among different classes of shares so with your usual way in which you decide the value of the entity you don't have to look at the liquidity even there the way you determine the value of the entity uh, while doing the uh, issuance of shares that is how you determine the value of the entity even in this there is no difference there okay right thank you so this question was can all the rights be incorporated in valuation of ccs so yeah the answer to this is only economic rights can be incorporated because as we saw earlier uh, most of the control rights in fact any of those control rights cannot be incorporated into the uh, valuation or allocation of value among the ccs it is only the economic rights which could be incorporated and in economic rights also there are some which could not be incorporated so the right answer to this is option c only economic rights can be incorporated can you take the last question as well excuse me sandeep yeah, uh, yeah. can you uh... Go ahead. Um, meanwhile, others can answer this question. Yeah, uh, can, can, you, ask question. can you explain or uh, drag along light a little more? Just finish this poll, then we can go there. Anti dilution drives important for value estimation. Even though it's a control right, but it's a control right, right? No, anti dilution is an economic right. Okay, so can you answer this question? Let's close the poll. Which of the following is an enterprise value allocation method? So the right answer to that is option pricing method. So DCF is to determine the value of the entity. Balance scorecard is just an option that I gave, the relevant option. Option pricing method is used to allocate the value. We discussed three methods for allocation of value. One was BWERM, the current value, and the option pricing method. Right. So these are the three methods which are used to allocate the value among our different classes of security. So the drag along right has the answer that. You've seen already already in one of these slides. In drag along right, the uh, preference shareholders of one series can compel the other preference shareholders or equity shareholders to vote in the way on certain transaction to vote in the way they decide. One series decides, they would compel the other series also to vote in a similar manner on a particular transaction. The idea is whenever, for example, if the entity is being sold or being acquired by someone, he would want to take absolute control of the entity, and if some series decide not to participate in that transaction, then the absolute control might not vest with the acquirer. That is the reason you have this drag along, right? Where one series can drag the other series of shareholders to vote in the way they have decided. So, in that case, if already a preference uh, shareholder is there, not the CCPRs are there, the new CCPRs who have drag along right can compel them to sell their share also. Right. Yeah, yeah. So they can. It's not new or existing in the current capital structure. Also, if there are CCPS holders who have drag along rights, they would be in a position to drag the other series of uh, CCPS holders also to vote in the manner that they have decided on certain transactions, not for everyone. Okay. I think we have taken all the poll questions, so we'll continue with our discussion. Yeah, so we have uh, decided the allocation of value, we've decided the breakpoints, and then we also decided the assumptions that we want to use for Black Scholes model here. So I've just summarized the entire uh, those assumptions here in this slide. So you can see that we're going to derive the value of each of those call options now. The stock price or spot price in our case is 50 million. This is nothing but the equity value of the entity, right? Then you have the excise price. So here you can see 0, 35 million, and 175 million. So this is what we have decided based on the breakpoints or the payoffs that we discussed in one of the slides earlier, where we said from 0 to 35, what will be the payoff distribution? 
35 to 175, what will be the payout distribution? And beyond 175, what will be the payout distribution? This excise price are determined based on those payout distributions. Essentially, that point of value beyond which the marginal allocation will change. The allocation proportions will change. That is what the payoffs are or the big points are. So excise price is 0, 35, 175 million. Time to expiry, it's an assumption we made, five, five years. Volatility, 30%, again an assumption. Pay rate is 7% based on the government bond yields. So using these assumptions, if I run the BSM formula, the formula that we saw earlier, my spot price into ND1 minus excise, present value of excise price into ND2, you will get the value of call option as 50 million for the first tranche, 27, uh, 0, 43, 795 for the second tranche, and this for tranche C. So this BSM formula also, I'll, when we go to the Excel, I'll be showing you the formula and how it works. But here, just for the time being, assume that you've run the BSM equation and you get these values. Okay. So up to this value of call option using BSM, are you all comfortable? Anyone is not clear, let me know. In a tranche, call option is 50 million, is it? Tranche, yeah, the value of call option is 50 because the excise price is nil, the stock price is 50, so it becomes 50 million here. Right? So typically your intrinsic value is 50 here, that is what the, the value of the of. So we have run the BSM equation and we have got this answer. For now, let's go with that. When you go to the Excel, we'll look at the numbers also, how these work in the formula. Now, once you've got the value of call option for each of these tranches, you need to decide the value of each tranche. So these are cumulative values. Now what we need to do is we need to come from the backward. We need to come from reverse and do subtraction. So for the tranche C, this entire value will flow down. This is the value of the tranche. For tranche B, the value would be D minus C. I would subtract 27, 0, 43, 795 minus 2090451. That will give me what is the tranche value of tranche B. What is the value of tranche B? Similarly, for tranche A, I'll do a subtraction here. 50 minus this, A minus B, that will give me 22.956 uh, million, right? So this is how you get the tranche values come from the reverse. Last tranche, this will flow down. For the earlier tranches, we'll do a subtraction. B minus C will give you the value of tranche B. A minus B will give you the value of tranche A. So the question should be A minus B minus C because they are valuing, you know, whatever is B minus C, that value should be actually reduced from A or should no, it be see, only A minus B? These are all cumulative values, right? So here itself you are doing B minus C, which means this is this 24 plus 2090. These two combined is this value. So B is cumulative value. So therefore B plus C is, is included in is is included in B, right? So we are getting, if we have to get B standalone, it is B. See, this 20, 27 is nothing but sum of these two. So here, what we need to do, then this 50 is nothing but sum of all these. So we're just subtracting one by one and we're getting what is the value that is attributable to this particular okay. tranche. So once you've got the tranche values, yes. The next step is to distribute these tranche values among the various series of instruments. Mr. Sandeep, can you please explain uh, tranches once again with context to this uh, table? Tranches has been taken as zero in tranche. So our starting point in all the cases would be zero. In fact, we'll put 0 0.001 or 0 0.01 because the BSM will not work otherwise with zero. So starting point will be zero because we want the total enterprise value here. The total value has to come here, right, in the first tranche. And then we saw that up to 35 is entirely equity. 35 to 175, it goes to reference. And then it is to all the shareholders. Based on that uh, allocation of cash flows or payoffs that we discussed earlier, we get these tranche values, tranche ABC, so 35 million, 175 million. So these are Beyond the lower... Low, lower part of the yeah, value. You can, you can take it that way. You can take it that way. Okay. So once you arrive at the tranche values using your BSM, the next step is to distribute these tranche values among the various classes of shares that the company has. Right. So let's do that in the next slide. Okay. 
Yeah, so we need to now allocate these trans values. Is it because of the numbers? Because uh, the value of trans B, essentially what we are saying is that the total investment of 50 million, you are distributing it at various points of time when the value of the enterprise value moves from zero to 175. So when the enterprise yeah, so value is zero, the risk is the highest. And then the enterprise value touches 35, the risk is moderate. Because, uh, and when it is touching 175, obviously everyone is going to convert into equity. Therefore, the lowest value is in trans C. I'm just curious between trans A and trans B, and trans A is lower than trans B. Is it because of the numbers that you have to that, Yeah, that will depend on liquidation preference. When would the uh, shareholder decide to convert and all of that? Typically, these trans values would be dependent upon the liquidation preferences. Based on that, you get the excise price, and your excise price uh, would affect these branch values. Okay, thank you. So once you derive the branch values, and we all already freeze the allocations. So we said in the first scenario, hundred percent goes to preference. So I've taken what how the allocation would look like. The allocation between Series A and common shares in tranche A, hundred percent goes to the CCPS. Trans B, that was from 35 to 175, 100% most equity. And then beyond that, it gets distributed 20%, 80%. So that is what I've captured here, the marginal allocation percentages. Then you multiply your value of tranche with the respective percentage, you will get how much of tranche value gets allocated to these and equity share. So here, uh, we've just multiplied this 22.9 million with 100%, you get entire value for series A. Second tranche, entire value goes to series uh, through the common equity shares. And in the third tranche, it gets divided in 20, 80%. So we've allocated these values or uh, distributed these values based on the marginal allocations. Once you've distributed these values, you sum them, you get what is the total value that is allocated to a particular class of security. So series A CCPS, they've got 23 million allocated out of the total 50 million. And common shares have got 26 million allocated out of the total. So this enterprise value total is 50. That 50 has been divided in this fashion among series A and common shares. So this is one uh, simple uh, structure that we have taken, series A and uh, common. We go to the Excel after we finish this, we'll also see how it works when there are multiple series of CCPS instruments. Uh, actually, okay. small, small thing, uh, yeah. the series A, CCPS and common. Okay, okay. No, nothing. These, these percentages, is this what is confusing you? So these are based on the payoffs that we determined in the initial uh, when we started the total the case study. column is little confusing like total equity 50 total, million total is nothing but sum of all these so here also it is sum of all this 50 million some of these numbers will give you 23 million some of these value allocated to common shares for each tranche will give you the total of common shares right 26 million uh, just to make it little more uh, clear sandeep uh, we are doing uh, at an uh, liquidation time, uh, let's suppose uh, a valuation time at one point of time, we got uh, 50 million. And since we have uh, two different categories of uh, uh, like uh, these equity holders, like CCPS and common shareholder, we are projecting uh, value like in three tranches, like uh, uh, it's up to 50, up to this, uh, why we are not doing as of now since uh, at we are at liquidation uh, uh, point and we know the value why we are not doing like uh, simply uh, this uh, first hey, you, are, you, are not at, you are not at liquidation point today okay this event liquidation event will happen sometime in future it's not going to happen today we so find why? out what is the value of the entity based on my future cash flows and all and then how that value would look different, different series, assuming the liquidation event happens within five years in our example. Okay. So uh, what, why we are like, like doing this exercise? There must be some uh, like... Uh... This is done to find out how much of that 50 million could be allocated to these values. If you feel that liquidation event is now going to happen, it's almost certain it is going to happen, then you go for current value method, one of the methods that we saw earlier. Where if it is a liquidation event happening tomorrow or on the valuation date, how these allocations would work. Then typically you can, I think, equally divide the values because in that case, 
inflation event happens and the entity gets a higher value, you can equally divide the value among uh, CCPS or equity depending on whether they choose to convert or not. If we feel there is a time for liquidation event to happen, then we do all this PWERM or OPM methods. If we feel the liquidation event is going to happen very soon, uh, it's eminent almost going to happen very soon, then you do a current value method. Where okay. what you suggested would be done. You will see if today the liquidation event happens, what would be the scenario? How would, how would these values get different? Uh, uh, is it correct? So essentially, what we are saying in this is just to confirm my understanding. Uh, okay. If I were to value equity, it is only 26.6 million. Because I'm getting the option, I'm valuing at 50 million. That's the interpretation, right? No, because you're getting the options and rights and everything, your series A is valued at 23 million. 50 is the total value, equity plus CCP. Yeah, agreed. So assuming that if I directly were to invest in equity with instead of being a CCPS, I would have valued the entity only at 26 million. Because I'm investing... The value as a... of the entity will not change because of these structures. Overall value of the entity is not dependent on the structure. The overall value of the entity is dependent on the uh, method that you choose. For example, if it is cash flow, BCF, then on the future cash flows. If it is a market approach, then on the comparables and uh, earnings or whatever factor you've taken. Overall value is not impacted by this. Once you've decided the overall value, how that value will be distributed among the various classes is what OPM will. So I just want to understand the uh, uh, the point where we are doing this value, why we are doing this uh, value, at what point of time we are doing this value. So, uh, event event when initial, we are, uh, event when we are. Event when we are. Point yeah. of the session, these valuations or these value allocation methods are typically used in case of financial reporting. Or when you're going to do a ESOP valuation, where you need the equity value separately, that is when you don't typically use these. Okay, right. Right. The reason why we do it is because you, that will, the next slide will answer your question. Sandeepji, I have a question. Like you said, this is used in ESOP and also suppose if we get an assignment relating to CCPS valuation where a company is issuing for the CCPS. In that scenario, should we be using this method or not? In case of instruments, as I told you, most of the cases, uh, the values equate all the instruments they take, yes. everything gets diluted and what will be the value per share. If you decide to use this, you can still use it by doing a back solve. You use a goal seek and you can do this. When we go to the Excel uh, file, I'll share that with you. Okay, and one more question. Uh, in the previous slide, the values that have been allocated to CCPS and equity. So shouldn't the value of CCPS be higher than equity because they have liquidation preference? Yes, so, so that is right, but that will be on per share basis. The Sorry? total value allocation on per share basis in the next slide, I'll be showing you how do we compute the per share value. So per share value when you compute, CCPS would have a higher value. That's this was the total value allocation that will depend on how many shares the CCPS holders have, what is the investment. But okay. once you got the value allocation done, the per share value, as you rightly pointed out, should be higher for CCPS because they command these additional rights, the liquidation preference, etc., on and above the equity share. Right? Okay, got it. So got now in the in the next step, what we need to do is I have got what is the total allocation these two series to the series A and the common shares out of 50 million. I know what is the value that goes to series A, what is the value that goes to equity shares, this is the total value. I now need to find out what is the per share value. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to divide this 23, this is the value of series A CCPS with the number of CCPS shares, the number of CCPS and this value 26.625 which is the total equity value by the number of equity share. That will give you what will be the per share value of CCPS and per share value of Yes, so this is how you do this. So you take the series A CCPS total value from the earlier slide, and we know the number of shares is 1 million. So you divide them, you'll get 23.4. You take the common share, value is 26.6 million as per the earlier slide. The number of shares, number of equity shares is 4 million. If you divide them, you'll get 6.7. So your per share value basis, series A have a 23.4 million value, common shares have a 6.7 million. Technically, the 35 million has become 23 million, right? As per this. Yeah, so the value per share here is 23.4 million. Now that will change based on the overall value of the entity that you have derived. Based on that, it will keep changing. 
Because of the liquidation preference shares, they are going to get full 35. So is that full 35 is breaking 24 because of the time value? Yes, because yes. we are assuming these things to happen at a future date. And on that date, when the liquidity event occurs, from there, if you bring those value to present value, how would it look like? You don't see 35 here. If you use the current value, then probably you, if, the, uh, if the conversion is not going to happen, you'll see a 35 here. So this yeah, difference actually, between 35 and 23 is because we are uh, making assumptions of a future liquidity event, not the current liquidity event. The liquidity event is expected to happen at a future date. Exactly. That is the reason you see these differences. I've also mentioned the source at the bottom of the slide. I would uh, request all of you also uh, get this material and read this. Uh, this would give you very good insights on uh, all of the discussions that I've done today. My PPT is also based on this particular material. So we've got the number of shares now. What we do is this particular case study is done. Let me go to the Excel now and uh, let us do one uh, case study with a multiple series of CC. Sandeep, assuming that uh, if any options is there, so ease options will be a minority rights. So whether we need to apply a deal in particular cases, suppose this option value is arriving based on this methodology. Since uh, CCPS is having, yeah, since CCPS is having uh, a lot of control rights, so it will be a control state. So when assuming that these options, ESOPs, especially ESOPs, so will not have any, these kind of alliance. So we need to reduce from the common equity to uh, arrive the uh, stock price of the option. So basically it's a deal on uh, specifically. I, I got a question. Got a question. So uh, when we do this, Still working, right? There's one case study that I've taken. I hope you're able to see the Excel file. Are you able to see the Excel? Yes. Yeah, so you can see in one of the case, which is case study number three, we also have the ESOPs as part of campaigns. We'll see how even, does the even, get allocated then. Yeah. Yeah, even in case of the equity also, sometimes I would, uh, I have seen this one, uh, DLAM is applied. In equity valuation. Yeah, so if equity you are going valuation. to do at time of issuance, you will have yeah. to apply DLAM, DLOX, depending on the transaction rate, DLOX or control premium. Yeah, and and the, in the above example, whatever you in the PPT you have presented, it will be a forward solve method. It is not a back solve method, right? Um, yeah, that's in the not sense, back solve. Uh, see, once you have fixed this, not forward, but this is the option pricing uh, uh, method here. Method, uh, but okay. once you fix this, you can also try to use this methodology for a back sort. Yeah. Where okay. we say that if this so, particular series is having this much of liquidation preference and this is the investment, if a new series comes in with X amount of investment, what should be the value that could be allocated to that? Series? What would be the value I, I believe, that, that is back sort. Uh, yeah, correct. So based on the latest for uh, latest round of financing, so we are arriving the uh, multiple uh, shares value or multiple uh, cap based on the capital structure. So that's what we have carried out. That, in that, that is back solve. That, so is back solve. that, you, that is the back you, solve. So yeah, if you take the value of the current issuance, what was the issuance at which the uh, what was the price at which the current issuance happened, and then you try to use the OPM or other any other method to back solve it for what could be the value of PT or the existing series that is back solve. That's right. Correct. Correct. So basically, we are arriving the implied equity value based on the latest fund, uh, latest fund because we latest know because we know the value of one of the series. So we yeah. keep that as a benchmark and try to value others. But in case you do not know that, that's when you will have to do this uh, these kind of allocation. If correct. you already know correct. that this is the value of one particular series. Then you can also use a back solve there. So I have a final one query. So when when we are doing see already distributed value which has been arrived to arrive the option value. Suppose in uh, in this example in the whatever you are showing in uh, Excel sheet, the ESOP value has been arrived. So now I am no, using this, the ESOP. This is not ESOP value. What we have arrived no, at I is am the CPS and common share. Value. Yeah. Okay, assuming that one ease of value has been arrived based on using the, this uh, OPM methodology, when I am using for the purpose of financial reporting of the ease of, 
so at that point of time uh, see now we have already distribution has been done in using the black shul model yep. you got my point so you are saying you already issued the esops earlier at that point of time you have done the valuation of esop now you no, are no, no, yeah, no, no, no. what no 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 see the uh, the ccps has been issued and equity allocation has been carried out and we have arrived the multiple capital structures or multiple series we arrive the prices and also along with that one they uh, they are having the options and warrants also it is there so finally we are arriving the option value of the equity st stock price so, so that the change my accounting of expenses is that your question yeah correct so uh, the assumptions what we have carried out here is the time to maturity is a 6 years we have carried out but when when it comes to ease of price ease of valuation so i using this uh, methodology i have arrived the stock price now Okay, yeah, the I distribution got, is already question. has been. Huh? I got a question, so. Uh, so distribution is already carried out. So uh, then, when I'm uh, for the purpose of financial reporting, the option price. So that is again, I need not to distribute right. So again, I need not to use the black shul model and arrive the price of that one. See for ESOPs accounting of expenses, that yeah. you will do only at the time of grant. At the Correct. time of grant, Correct. you find out the value of equity and do the expense accounting. Later on, the subsequent series happen, the value of the ESOPs change or the value of the equity change. That will not impact my existing uh, ESOPs that have been granted. That recognition of expense will continue in the same uh, amount that we are, uh, we, are, we are planned upon at the time of granting of those ESOPs. If any Assuming new ESOP is being offered, that time these values will have to be substituted. Compute the expense but for them. But my question is that to see, assuming that the issue of CCPS and the grant date is same, so I have carried out this valuation. It is nothing but the, the option price, whatever we are arrived based on the OPM methodology. So that will be the, the price for the uh, stock price, okay. right? So if you are granting, let's say you are granting uh, the stocks today, then you got an equity value of 6.7. You take this okay. 6.7, substitute in your equity shares, uh, sorry, in your BSM when you are computing the value of the stock. With the other assumptions yeah. that you created there, that will give you the value of ESOP. So, in Correct. the ESOP so, valuation, one of the inputs is equity value, right? That is why you can take this. Yeah, yeah, six point seven. I agree. So uh, then, shouldn't be a double distribution. So here also you are using BSM, and again, you, when you are carrying out the ESOP valuation, that will be a second a second time you are distributing the six point seven once so again. It is it is not double distribution. The objectives are different in both the exercise. Here, in this exercise, we try to find out what is the value distribution among the series. There, we are trying to find out what is the value of the ESOP for the purpose of recognizing expenses. And later on, once those ESOPs are granted, then they also form part of my capital structure. And I can do a value allocation over those ESOPs as well. We are taking up in one of the examples. No, uh, I I got it, but I am just assuming this one. It is going to be a double distribution because we have already carried out the, to array the six point seven as a once again as a distributed price. No, so no, again, it is not we double distribution out. because when you did this allocation, ESOP was nowhere in the picture in the number of shares. We have not distributed any value to the ESOP. ESOP no, is no, nowhere no, in assume, the picture. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, not in this example. I'm just assuming that in uh, you have a multiple series plus options and warrants. So if it is there, in that case, uh, what would be the impact? Uh, that's what I was just. So that is only on the existing instruments you want to distribute the value, right? But you are saying the new ESOPs are being granted now. For that, uh -huh. you are doing the ESOP valuation. The allocation that you do here is on the existing series, which is already there in the capital structure. Something that is going to be granted newly now that is not incorporated here in our working. That is why we need to do the ESOP management. Yes, okay, okay, got it. Uh, in my case, sir. it is in my case it is inclusive of uh, complete cap table. So including of future dilution also, which we have incorporated. Okay, got it, sir. Thank you. So this I will be sharing this Excel also with uh, the participants, the PPD as well, BVA. And share it with all of you. So this first sheet is nothing but the same example that we saw on the slide. So if in case you're not comfortable with the slide numbers, how they've been arrived, you can go back to this uh, Excel sheet and refer it. I will not uh, get into this again. We already done this activity, and these are the values that we have. Right? The workings are in the Excel. I'll be sharing this Excel with all of you. 
what we'll now do is, uh, in whatever time is left with us, we'll try to look at a uh, capital structure with, which has more than one series of CCPS. So we saw in the previous case with one series of CCPS, how will you distribute? If there are more than one series of CCPS, how the value allocation will happen? Let us understand that. So in this example, you can see we have these classes of shares. We have equity share and we have series ABC. Uh, these are the three series of CCPS. The investment amounts are given here. So these are the amounts they invested when these instruments were issued to them. And based on uh, based on your uh, value per share, these value per share nothing but your liquidation preference essentially. These are the liquidation preferences. Based on this, we also got what is the number of shares that these instruments currently are in the cap table. So this this data will be there in the cap table of the company. Uh, you can uh, take it from there. So we have these series, this set of uh, instruments in the cap. Table. Now, another point is that all investors have liquidation preference equal to their investment. Whatever amount they've invested, that is the amount of liquidation preference they have. It was not equity for these preference share. And there's also seniority of instrument. So in case there's a liquidation event and liquidation preference has to be distributed, series C would be the topmost then followed by series B and series A. So this is the seniority. Series C, which was the last series, would be on the topmost in terms of seniority then series B and then series A, right? So this is fine, the seniority part. Yeah, okay. Sure. So now let us understand in this kind of a capital structure where there are different series and different liquidation preferences and also a seniority among these series, how would our breakpoints be decided? Right? Because that is the most crucial part of this, uh, this entire exercise. How are the breakpoints going to be decided? So I start with zero as usual, uh, first, as I told you, should be 0 0.01 because when you solve for the PSM, uh, you will have to start with 0 0.01 to get the total value here. And then when you do subtraction, the sum of all the tranche values would come to what is the enterprise value you okay. So this is zero. And my breakpoint one would be the liquidation preference of series C. Up to 100 million, the entire amount will be distributed to series C. Right, so that becomes my first breakpoint. From 100 to 50, uh, 150 million, that is when the entire amount will go to series B because they have the second seniority in the capital structure. Then the third, the second breakpoint is 150 based on that. This is nothing but liquidation preference of series C and series B. After 150 till 160, the entire distribution will go to series A. That is how my third breakpoint is decided here. Third big point is sum of all these liquidation preferences. Up to this, I think it should be fine with all of you. These first three breakpoints. It is not clear. Let me know. These first three breakpoints are simple payoffs. So if my enterprise value is 100, it will go entirely to series C. If my enterprise value is 150, it will be distributed among series C and B. And if it goes up to 160, it will be among these three series. So that's how we one got the breakpoints. One down. Yeah. Among uh, series A, B, C, why C will get the first preference and then all are uh, all are preference shareholders, sorry, no? Yes, all are preference shareholders. So as we discussed when we were discussing about the rights, okay. typically the later series that happen, they would want seniority not only over equity, but also over the other series of preference shares. They would expect a seniority, they would want to negotiate a seniority. Not only about about the equity, but also about the earlier or existing series of CCPS. It could be both the ways. It could either be a seniority kind of a structure that we see here, or in some cases, it could also be a pari passu where all the preference shares would stand equal in case of liquidation. So the second example that I have here in the Excel uh, is a pari passu liquidation preference where both the series would be equally entitled to the uh, liquidation proceeds at the same time. There is no seniority. It could be either of these structure. Typically, the CCPS holders would uh, negotiate a structure like this where they would be senior compared to the existing series of CCPS. Now, it depends on the negotiations and what are the terms have been agreed. Uh, but yeah, I have taken both the examples here. One with seniority. This third sheet has an example without seniority where all of them are paribas in liquidation preference. Okay. Yeah, so we've got the first three breakpoints, 100, 150, 160, which is essentially derived from the liquidation preferences of these three series. After that, the question is, up to what will series A not convert into equity? So can you tell me what would be the level up to which series A will not convert to equity? Can 
Can you repeat that? Up to what point will Series A, up to what enterprise value will Series A CCPS holders not convert into equity? They would decide to take their preference, liquidation preference. Give me that number up to which series A CCPS will not decide to convert into equity. Like in our example in this slide, we said up to 175 million CCPS holders will not convert into equity. Similarly, here, what would be that number up to which series A CCPS holders will not convert into equity? Uh, one, one crore. One crore. How did you get that? 25 lakhs into four. No, it is 12.5%. 25, 25 divided by 2.08, whatever is the proportional share is there. That is 2.08. Okay, proportion, fine then. That is the proportional share if he converts, right? And that proportional share should fetch him 10 million. Until that point of time, will not convert. Let me make it easier. So equity shareholders, sorry, the series A CCPS holders will not convert into equity until the point where all the other series which are senior to them plus this series get their liquidation preference. And also the equity shareholders get a value of four rupees. Because if the equity shareholders are getting anything below four, it is beneficial for me to remain a series A CCPS and get the liquidation preference for per share up to that point up to where the liquidation preference of the ccps is not met and the equity shareholders not get four rupees they would not want to convert into equity so that point with a formula could be decided like this the liquidation preference of all the series plus one million okay how many one crore shares multiplied by four per share which is the liquidation preference of series up to this value up to 200 Series A CCPS will decide not to convert into equity. Does it make sense? Yes, sir. It is just uh, based on the discussion we had in this slide that up to 175 million there, the, series, the CCPS holders will not convert into equity. Similarly, you need to figure out those levels for each of these series in our example here. Series A, B, C, at what point or beyond what point would they want to convert into equity? Those would be our break. So for series A, it is 200. For series B, it is going to be liquidation preference of uh, these two series. Plus, until both the equity and series A get a value of 12 rupees. To that point, series B will not convert into equity. Yeah. Uh, can, I, can I say something, sir? Yeah. Yeah, I think once for series A, uh, technically they are the first ones because B and C come later after the liquidation preferences are over, it is 25 divided by 125. Others remaining as CCPS, only A and B are, A and equity are there, which is 25 and one. So that is 25 divided by 125. Yes, is... but any any value will come to them only after liquidation preference. Yeah, I agree C, that. I agree that. A is met. I, I agree that. So 25 divided by 125 is 20%. So 20% is what should be the value uh, for him to get his 10 million. Only then he will convert equity. So therefore, you got 200, right? I don't get that percentage concept that you're talking about. Uh, but you need to look at beyond which point they will convert into equity. So they will convert into equity only when these two set of people are able to get 4 rupees at least. Beyond that only they'll be converting. And these guys get their liquidation preference. So up to that point, till when they get their liquidation preference and these shareholders get 4 rupees, they would prefer to be CCPS. Beyond that, they, it will be beneficial for them to convert into equity because they will start getting something more than four. So that's how this number has been derived. Similarly, for series B, they will convert after the liquidation preferences of these two are met and both equity and series A get a value which is 12 rupees. Up to this point, they will not convert. After this, it will be beneficial for series B to convert into equity. Series C, it will be liquidation preference of series C itself and then until these three securities get a value per share of 20. Up to that point, it is better for them to remain a CCPS and get the liquidation preference. Once all of them have reached 24 rupees, that means now it is better to convert and participate in that excess value. 
So even CCPS of CVC would get more than 24 if they convert after enterprise value of 500. So that is how these breakpoints are decided. You need to see up to which point the allocation, marginal allocation, the additional value, which we get here 100 to 150, up to which point these marginal allocation remain constant. The point where these marginal allocations change, the distribution of this marginal value changes, that is our breakpoint. So in this case, we get six breakpoints. So these number of breakpoints will typically depend on the seniority and these values per share and number of shares. Based on that, you can determine the breakpoints. Beyond 500, it will be beneficial for all of them to convert into equity and participate as equity shares. So that's how we get these set of breakpoints. Are these clear? This might be a little uh, tricky thing to understand. And that's the reason I'll be sharing the Excel also with you. So after this session, you can again just sit back and try to understand this uh, peacefully at your own pace. It will You'll be able to get this. The concept is that up to this point, these guys are not going to convert into equity. What is to determine? That becomes my breakpoint. Okay. So once you've got your breakpoints, then you need to figure out what is the value allocation that will happen to each series at these different different breakpoints, right? So this is the same exercise that we did in the uh, slide as well. On the basis of number of shares, you need to figure out for each breakpoint how the value allocation will happen. So we are saying breakpoint one is liquidation preference of series C. So breakpoint one will be entirely distributed to series C. That is why you see in series C, I have the number of shares. This 41,70,000 is the number of series C shares from here. This is the 41,70,000. So entire value will get distributed to series C. Breakpoint 2 entirely goes to series B. Breakpoint 3 entirely goes to series A. That is what we had here. Then from breakpoint 4 onwards, the distribution will be for equity. Breakpoint 5 will be equity and series A. Whichever series that distribution is going to happen, to capture the number of shares of that respective series in this particular breakpoint. So breakpoint one, only series C. And at the end, it goes to everyone. So I've taken number of shares of all the series, all the shares. Now, once you fix this number of shares, you simply compute the percentages, which is nothing but my total here. So how is this percentage derived? Total value, total number of shares divided by what allocation goes to them. Right? So 100, 100, 100 here, and even here. But after that, the proportions will not be 100 because the distributions will happen to two instruments. Here it is to equity and A. So this is the total. This is nothing but sum of all this. And then I figure out what percentage will go to this series. 20% goes to series A, 80% goes to equity. Similarly, you do that for all the breakpoints. You will get these percentages. Number here divided by total number. What percentage goes to which series? So in case everybody converts to equity, 12% will go to A, 20%, 20% to B and C, and 48% to equity. So these total allocations should always be 100. The total of all this has to be 100. Total should be 100. So you got what is the allocation at each breakpoint. Right? Now the next step is to compute the value of all options at each of these each of these strike price, these would become my strike price. These are the strike price which I'm going to take in the BSM equation. Each of these strike price, what would be the value of call option? And then I do the subtraction, come from backward, uh, come from the reverse and do the uh, subtraction, get what is the value of each tranche, right? It's the same step that we did uh, for that simple scenario. Nothing new here, just that you see so many tranches because we had so many complaints. Yeah, so this is the computation of tranche value. Uh, what I've done is I've taken equity value. These are the assumptions of BSM. This is nothing but we have just used a BSM here. So using the BSM, we try to find out the fair value of options. What would be the fair value of option? And in this file, all these, uh, there are some hidden rows. Basically, that is where the calculation is done. So I'll be sharing this with you. You can look at them. This computation of BSM is all there. Formulas are there. How is B1 calculated? How is ND1 calculated? ND2. And once you get ND1, ND2, you, need, you know what needs to be done. Your spot price multiplied by ND1 minus present value of excise price multiplied by ND2. Those calculations are here. I will not get into that calculation. Uh, let's focus on the value allocation now. Calculation. 
So we made these assumptions here. We have taken uh, time to expiry of five, risk free rate two percent, volatility fifty percent, and so on. Dividend yield would typically be zero because startups generally don't uh, give any dividends. So it will typically be zero in uh, almost all cases. There could be exceptions, but typically it will be zero. So once you get these assumptions and then the calculations that I've just hidden, I'd show you and I've hidden them now. You get the value of all options for each branch size price. These excise price are nothing but the breakpoints. At the end, I've also mentioned how do you get these values? What are these values? Each of these assumptions. These are the breakpoints. And branch value, you start from the reverse and do the subtraction. For the last branch, it will be this same value, 204. Earlier tranches, it will be this minus this. Similarly, here it is going to be 339 minus 283. Here it will be 366 minus 339 and so on. You get the value of each tranche. Make sure this total value of each tranche would be equal to the total enterprise value that you've assumed. So here we've assumed 500, 500 million. So this total is equal to 500, right? Once you've got the value of each tranche, the next step is to use this tranche value and this allocation percentage that you've computed and assign the value of each tranche among these uh, of its triple. That is what we do here. We're saying tranche one uh, goes 100% to series C. So tranche one value is taken from here, our BSM calculation and then the subtraction, get the tranche one value, goes 100% to series C. So this entire value of 89 million is allocated to series C. Right? So you do this distribution for each tranche and you see uh, here onwards, tranche five goes to two series. So we have the value divided among two series. Trans 6 goes to 3 series of uh, instruments, so it is divided among 3. And trans 7 goes to everyone, so it gets divided. The total 204 gets divided to all the securities in these proportions. These proportions are just taken from this table we had computed earlier. So once you've got the value allocation of each tranche, what you need to do is you need to sum up these values series-wise. So from each of these tranche, series A gets these values. So total allocation to series A is nothing but 7 plus 11 plus 12 plus 24. That gives me. So likewise, you calculate the sum of the series. That gives you out of the total 500 million, how much is allocated to different instruments. Right? Now I've got what is the value allocated to each series. I can go and divide them by the number of shares and get what will be the per share value. That is what we're doing here in this last table. We take what value is allocated to each series from here and then divide by number of shares. We get what is the per share value. If I divide equally, I get 24. Using OPM, these are the values that we get for each series. Any doubts in any of these calculations? I think we have already overshoot the time. So if there's anything, just quickly tell me, we can take it up. I'll be sharing this Excel with you so you can go through it later as well. And all the calculations are linked here. So if you change anything anywhere, the calculations will get updated. And uh, the last example that I had was with Pari Parsu. I will not get into the calculations, but the only difference that will happen, the key difference that will happen is in the big points. So in the earlier example, when it was seniority wise, we saw the liquidation preferences coming thrice here. We had three liquidation preference. When it is Pari Parsu, which means all the CCPS rank equal, in terms of uh, distribution of liquidation uh, values, there you only have one breakpoint for liquidation value, which will be some of these. You don't have 1000 and then 2500, you still have 2500. That is where the difference would be. Rest of the breakpoints uh, would be the same way up to which point the series will not convert and so on. And then once you've got the breakpoints, the calculation is just the same that we discussed in two examples that we already saw. Okay, so I think uh, I've broadly covered what I wanted to cover in the session today. We will just a little bit overshoot the time. So if there is any question, you can take them up quickly. Uh, sir, so in this uh, OPM method, we have uh, incorporated uh, two rights of the uh, two economics right, right? Uh, one is preferential distribution and second is... Uh, um, the we have is, taken the liquidation preference. That, that liquidation is what we took preference. Going yes. Uh, and the, the, the thing, 
liquidation preference and one more participating right rates and and the uh, uh, their preference conversion uh, rights uh, and liquidation senior rights is what we have taken yeah you're right yeah. conversion right and liquidation preference right we have okay. considered both right yeah we have taken them into account so see there are uh, some more uh, methods that you can use like monte carlo simulation etc uh, if you want to really put into place the anti dilution uh, value as well you can do a little bit of more uh, uh, additional workings like monte carlo simulation where you create scenarios where there will be down round and then how would that anti dilution uh, play and assign probabilities get the values so you can uh, go and do as much complex calculations as you want but i think to start with uh, this is a good starting point for us as our practice develop in this area we can uh, explore more and do more of it any further question yeah yeah any other questions from the members uh, sandeep Sir, only one last question the... yeah hello uh, yeah uh, so this time to maturity see majority of the agreements what we have see, uh, seen the qualified ipo should happen uh, exit time they might have given so 3 years and also they have given our option of strategic sale if the qualified ipo is not happening then they may go for a strategic sale by the a promoter to any of the third party in okay. those kind of a scenarios so whether we need to restrict the time period or uh, uh, we need it, to consider is, multiple scenarios necessary, it is not necessary that you have to strictly go by whatever is mentioned in the term sheets or in the agreements they might have mentioned three years there but as a valuer do yeah. you feel that it is achievable in three years typically for a startup going for ipo in a three years or even perhaps a strategic sale in three years might not be a reality might not happen yeah, correct so that mm -hmm. assessment a valuer has to do if he feels that this should be a longer period he can ignore what is given in the agreement because even if that doesn't happen if the liquidation of the ipo doesn't happen in three years it is not that all the ccp holders will come and ask the money back or do something there they might have to yeah. wait because if they feel that there is good value that we can realize by waiting then that period could be longer five years 10 years also it is not necessary that we need to restrict to that three years what would be appropriate for this company is what we would take here agree so we had a detailed discussion with the management and then with the auditors so we have concluded in different manner so so you can, that that is, the, yeah that will depend on uh, the assessment of the valuer and also some of the factors that i told you so discussion with management is also a good point uh, plus you can also look at the life cycle the stage in the life cycle where the company is currently and other factors like what is the strategic intent of the management see, see sometimes it is possible that you can go for a ipo event today but the management might not have that strategy they i mean the, the strategic call that they might have is we'll wait for another five years probably that is the time when we will get a better valuation so those inputs needs to be incorporated when you try to freeze this uh, time to expiry uh, but of course i mean you cannot say that there is some scientific formula by which I'll get this always. No, no. Most it of the time, it is a qualitative assessment. Exactly, it's a qualitative assessment, and you try to incorporate as many factors as possible. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think we can stop. Okay, that uh, further questions. Maybe we are running out of time. And Sandeep, okay, it is very uh, useful, very excellent session. Okay, on this. Uh, uh, valuation of a different uh, structures. Now I request uh, Chandrasekhar to give formal vote of thanks. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I take this opportunity to thank the speaker, uh, Mr. Sandeep Kothari. Mr. Sandeep Kothari, the excellent, one of the excellent session among uh, which we had recently. And you started you valuation complex securities, started the valuation of various parameters and the purchase. Uh, SHAs, economic rights, and also this um, uh, contractual rights, and uh, went on explaining all the questions. And then we overshot the time. I think the session was much beneficial to all the members. And I thank you on behalf of um, uh, BBA members and all participants. This is one of the sessions. I think members got enriched good knowledge. And uh, I also thank BBA for organizing an excellent session. And maybe we, we can think of a uh, few more sessions. Uh, within the same series. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sandeep Kothari. Thank you, participants. Yeah. And thank you, BVA organizers. Sir. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, yeah. all of you. Yeah. And uh, thank you, BVA, for giving me this uh, opportunity to uh, 
come and share this particular presentation today. Yes. Thanks a lot, all of you, for your time and uh, patient listening. Also, Mr. Sandeep Kothar, I think there are many people are request. Yeah, you confirmed that many people are requesting in the chat uh, your presentations and the IRC Excel links. I hope uh, I think you. I'll, I'll share that. I'll share that with BBN. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Sand sir. Yeah, Sandeep, this is a small moment from us, and we will courier to your address. And I request uh, to share the presentation and the Excel sheet, and we will uh, uh, upload it to our web BBA website, and we will share to the BBA members and uh, for everything benefit. Thank you, Sandeep. Thank that. you very much. Thank you. And, and have a great weekend for everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.